together today, the Lord reminded me that even though this room is full, that each of us have brought in a different experience. We've got hurts and habits and hangups. We've got places where we feel pressed, where we feel squeezed. Some of us are being stretched way beyond our comfort zone than anything that we've ever would have thought possible. And God, in his infinite wisdom today, as we worship, as we chase after all the things that God has for us, he has the same truth for us today as he did thousands of years ago on the cross, is that he sent his son to die for us. That through that crucifixion, that all of the pain that we feel in this world will be temporary. And there will be a day where every tear that we've shed will be wiped from our eyes and we will be made whole. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget in the midst of the struggle that one day this is gonna be over. (laughs) And the pain that we've experienced is gonna be like this compared to the infinity that we're gonna spend with our Savior. 
And I'm incredible. That's an incredible thing to celebrate today. I'm also just beyond, I can't even look at them. I looked at them the first two services and cried. The this fact that our student team is leading us today to that place, I think, is absolutely amazing. Thank y'all. Y'all are, I can't, I can't look at them. I wonder if you could help me out as you're finding your seat. If you could help us kind of squeeze to the middle. We kind of, we got a couple more folks trying to come in and we want to squeeze. Just look to the person next to you and say, I'm coming over. You know, the fact that our student team is on the platform this weekend is very intentional because this is our annual back to school weekend where we celebrate all that God has done over the summer and all that God is going to do in the new school year. And regardless of where you fall, in the uh, dichotomy of back to school, you may be like me as a parent who's counting down the minutes until these kids have something to do. Or if you're like the kids in my house or the kids upstairs in Element or in North Country, they are bemoaning the last few minutes of their summer. But man, we believe in the power of the next generation at Life Fellowship, that we believe that when we equip kids with truth, when we equip, we, we, when we equip kids with hope, they can make a difference in their schools and their campuses, regardless of so much that we want to be able to equip them in a lot of different ways. We also want to be able to empower moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, all of us that have the, the next generation in our house. And we want you to feel like this is your place for you. Even listening to Pastor Chris's podcast this week, parenting is not easy. It is not for the weak. Amen. Amen. And then finally, there's a third group of people that, man, I really want to take a moment to honor and to recognize today. Uh, our teachers, our educators, and I say teachers, I mean like from the little guys to the big guys, college, preschool, elementary, high school, all of it, principals, administrators, the amazing janitorial crews that make our campuses run. I was up at my wife's school yesterday helping her hang all the million things that have to be hung. And I was just blown away by the number of teachers giving up beyond their, their work hours to make sure that their classrooms are ready for their kids to have the best experience. And regardless of what you see on the internet or hear other people say, teachers are giving everything they have to our kids. And I think that's something that we can absolutely stand behind. And you're a teacher at a school, a preschool, an administrator, you, you're in the field of any education in any capacity. Would you do me a favor, could you stand up so that we could honor and pray for you today? Yes. All of our amazing, amazing people. Our ushers are coming by and we're gonna give you just a little thank you. If you'll stand up just for one more second because we don't want you to miss your, you've got some goodies that I promise you you're gonna want. And while you're standing, man, I would love for us to join our hearts together one more time in prayer and pray for our teachers today. So let's pray together. God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you did through Jesus on the cross. And thank you that you've equipped, called and empowered these men and women to lead our kids in the field of education. God, I pray that this year would be the year of revival in their personal lives and their families. And I pray that that revival would spill over into our classrooms and our hallways on all of our school campuses that God, we would begin to see your glory and your purpose and your spirit empowering our teachers and students like never before. God, we pray this because of what you did through Jesus on the cross. Amen. Thank you so much. And it is going to be a phenomenal weekend. Pastor Chris has got a great message. Let's watch this together. Hey, everybody, good to have you with us today for the conclusion of our series that we've entitled 52. Of course, I'll tell you a lot more about that here in just a second. But first of all, I want to remind you all that we do have a Saturday night service and a 12 o'clock and a 9 o'clock service that you guys would be more than welcome to attend if you guys would like, all right? Even though they're all actually starting to really, really fill up, but it, it'd be great. But hey, we want to say a big hello to our Church Online family and all the guys and gals in 109 <laughs> Department of Corrections. Come on, everybody. 
So glad that you're with us. Well, hey, um, I just wanted, uh, before we jump into the message, let me just say this. This series has been revolutionizing so many people's lives. And I've been hearing from so many people about how, man, you're ready to take the step. You, it's time for you to step out. And you've been asking so many of you saying, what do I do? What's the next step? What does that look like? And so let me just take one minute before we jump into the message today and just say that if maybe you're new around here or maybe you've never done this, I'm going to encourage you to take the first step, and that's to attend our growth track classes. We have two classes that happen every single Sunday at 1030. They take about an hour each. And in these two classes, you get an opportunity to find out who we are, our vision, our history, where we're going, our, our church government. Uh, and, and as well, we give you an opportunity to discover your spiritual gifts. We say it like this around here, that it's really hard to champion a church that you don't know anything about. And so when you get an opportunity to go through this class, number one, we, we, get, we get an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better, and then you get to know us a little bit better. And after that, it opens the door for you to get on a dream team to begin to make a difference in one of the 25 different areas of ministry here at the church, whether that's leading a life group or getting involved in kids or teenagers or guest experience, correctional facility, you name it. And I'm just going to say this, that if you have already gone track and you're not on a dream team, what are you waiting for? So if you'll just do me a favor, just take out your phone, you can scan that QR code uh, we've also have, we have that QR code on our family wall that is in the main lobby. Or you can stop by guest services and ask them, you know, how do I do this? Uh, within just a matter of minutes, you can fill out that online application, and then one of our pastors, coaches, or department head leaders will get in touch with you this week, and together we're going to begin to make a difference and advance the cause of Christ together. Amen. So I'd encourage you guys to do that here today. Um, we are in the conclusion of our series that we've been studying through the story of Nehemiah. And today, we're going to answer this question. How do you finish strong? Now, for those of you that maybe missed last week, let me kind of just bring us all up to speed to give you a little bit of context. We've been studying through the story of Nehemiah. It's a book that was written in 444 B.C., so Nehemiah was serving as the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes in Persia. And one day he's talking to his brother. And he asks his brother, hey, brother, how, how are things going back in Jerusalem? Brother says, man, Nehemiah, you're not going to like this. Things are bad. Like, they're really, really bad. Uh, the walls have been broke down for 140 years. It's, it, it's left the people very, very, very vulnerable to attack. And on top of that, it's very, very embarrassing to God, and nobody can fix it. And all of a sudden, Nehemiah, this ordinary man, gets an extraordinary burden. He sits and he cries, he kneels and he prays, and then he stands to act. He goes and stands before the king. He says, king, would you give me permission to go back to, to Jerusalem to be able to rebuild the walls? And the king blesses him. So he travels a 1,000 miles, gets back to Jerusalem, and takes the people, brings them together, and he begins to galvanize them around the vision and says, listen, this does not honor God. This is not our heritage. This does not protect our children and our grandchildren. We've got to do something about this. I know it's been we've been in defeat for the last 140 years, but let's make a difference together. And the people rose up. And in 52 days, they rebuilt what everybody else was not able to do in 140 years. Now today, what you're going to discover, and I just want you to be prepared, uh, things get a little twisted. This is kind of, get, it gets a little soap opera-ish, it gets a little Jerry Springer-ish. Uh, there's a latch to this scripture that we're going to read today. It would sound like this. Dun, 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 dun. Okay? Just be aware. So it says in verse 1 that when the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, 
And how, how many of you guys remember from last week, these are bad dudes, like really bad guys. Okay, so when news came to them and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it up to that time. So watch this. The walls were completely rebuilt. but They had one last thing that they needed to do. He said, I had not set the doors in the gates. So I was almost finished, but not quite yet. And what I want you to experience today, this spiritual principle, is this truth that the closer you get to doing what God said do, the harder your enemy is going to fight to stop you. How many of you have ever experienced that that opposition before in your life? Come on, where are you at? Come on, come on, come on. I mean, you're trying to do what God has asked you to do, and the closer you get to trying to finish it, I mean, the opposition gets even more intense. In fact, I taught you this last week, that opposition doesn't come because you're doing something wrong. It's actually happening because you're doing something right. For some of you guys, this series has really been moving you towards accomplishing the thing that God has spoken to you to do and what you've been encountering as you've gotten closer and closer to that is opposition. So maybe you're somebody that God burden to lead a life group. And you're thinking, man, I want to create spiritual community. I'm going to walk with these people together. We're going to do life together in the things of God. And so you sit down to fill out that volunteer application. And in the middle of doing it, your child comes in and breaks their arm. Opposition. Like you were almost there completing what you needed to do. But because you had opposition, you never filled it out. Or maybe just maybe you're just discovering, you know what, we don't have a godly marriage. We need to change this. And you go to your your spouse and say, baby, Christ is not in the center of our marriage. We've been been married for over 10 years, and baby, we're going to get ourselves in church. We're going to get connected in, and we're going to let God do something in our marriage that we've never seen happen before. So the very next week, you get yourself in the car to go to church, and somebody's a little late. Somebody else is a little rude. While you're driving, all hell breaks loose in that car. You know, the mother of all fights <laughs> takes place. Now, that hasn't happened to any here. Not you guys. <laughs> it happens to all other people that are outside of our church. Or maybe for you, you've just determined, I am going to get healthy. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and I want every aspect of my life, everything, to bring glory and honor to God, including my health. So you've worked really hard. You've fought. You've eaten right. You've worked out. You've paid the price. And now you are 10 pounds away from reaching your goal. And you walk into... And Twinkies are on sale. (laughs) Buy one box, get 22 free, baby. (laughs) Here's what I need you to know today, everyone. The closer you get to doing what God said to you to do, the harder your enemy will fight to stop you. And so today, here's what I want to show you. I'm going to show you two of the main strategies that your spiritual enemy is going to try to employ to stop you from accomplishing what it is they do. So if you're taking notes, jot this down. And if you're not taking notes, jot this down. Number one, here's the first thing. The enemy is going to try to distract you. First thing he'll try to do, as you get... As you start moving forward to do what it is that God has asked you to do, just get ready for it. He's going to try to, he's going to try to abort your accomplishment by distraction. In fact, let me say it like this. He doesn't even need to defeat you. Just has to distract you. In fact, let's see this play out here in uh, Nehemiah chapters 2. Sam Ballad and Geshem sent this message. Come, 
Let's meet together. So come on, stop the work. Get off the wall. Let's meet in one of the villages in the plain of, oh no. <laughs> Come on, everybody. I want everybody in the house to say, oh no. Oh no, oh, no. Oh, no baby. Don't you go. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> Yeah, you, did, you would say, oh, no, if you watch this white boy up here dance. <laughs> I'm a white boy from Wisconsin. I got no rhythm or rhyme, I'll tell you that. But I do like to have a good time. So, hey, there you go. Spiritual principle of the day. Never, underneath any circumstances, agree to go meet with somebody in a place called, oh, no. Don't do it. Don't, don't, don't do it. I'm, I'm just saying. See, here's what was happening. Um, they saw that Nehemiah was actually accomplishing what he set out to do. And so they said, man, we got to stop him. We got to stop him from advancing and building these walls. I know how we'll, we'll hinder him from accomplishing. We will destroy distract him. And if you actually read on, what you're going to discover is they didn't just want to distract him. They actually wanted to, to give him bodily harm. I promise you this. Anytime that you become somebody, that you begin to move forward to accomplish what it is that God has spoken to you to do, get ready for distraction to visit your life. And here's what you need to be aware of. It's typically never going to be something that's Big. See, your enemy knows that you're way too smart to fall for that. You're not going to fall for this. It's typically something a whole lot smaller. In fact, let me say it like this. Little distractions over time become big distractions. So, for example, maybe you feel like God's given you this burden to develop and provide clean drinking water for people around the world. And so you think, God, I know that you got, it. you got a plan for me. You're going to help me. So you sit down at your computer. You're ready to do some research. You're ready to pray, strategize, let God speak to you. And just before you start, you think, you know, let me just take a minute and just see what's on Instagram. Three and a half hours later, you ain't got squat done. And what happened was, is that something that was little distracted you from something that is great. Let me say it like this. Don't allow something that is good to distract you from something great. Because all of you, when you begin to step out and do what it is that God has called you to do, I'm just telling you that your enemy is going to try to distract you. He doesn't need to defeat you. He doesn't even need to fight you. He just needs to distract you. And when that happens, you're going to need to do something. You're going to need to believe something in the deepest part of your being. You're going to need to wrap your heart around it with all of your might. You're going to need to speak it out with everything that you've got. You're going to have to say these words, I'm not coming down. Come on, I want everybody in the house, everybody online, in the correctional facilities, I need a little growl in your voice. I need every one of us on the count of three to say those words with me. Come on, one, two, three. I'm not coming down. I'm not coming down. I'm not coming down. It doesn't matter what it looks like, I'm not. I'm telling you, the enemy saw that he was about to advance, that they were about to accomplish what God had asked him to do. They said, we got to stop him. We know how we're going to stop him. We're going distract, to distract him. So let's see if he'll come to a meeting in a place called, oh, no. And Nehemiah fired back and said, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. I ain't going. In fact, let's see it here. Okay? 
It says in verse 2, the very next verse, that they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? I'm not coming down to you. I'm doing something important right now. Look at my eyes and hear this, everybody. You're going to have to have courage to say no to the distractions in your life, even when they're good things. In fact, let me say it like this. Our church... We are not good at a lot of things. We're good at a few things. I'll tell you what we're good at. We're good at regeneration. We're good at leading people in worship. We really are. We're good at managing finances. I mean, we we could do that all day long. We we do a lot on a little. Uh, We're good at investing into missions, both nationally, locally, and internationally. We're good at taking the gospel, the Bible, and making it real, real simple so that somebody that did not grow up in church can understand it. We're we're good at coming alongside and helping people to discover their purpose and to find freedom. Like, we're good at a few things, but we're not good at a lot of things. You would be amazed at the things that people have come to us through the years that have said, hey, we, we think you guys need to do this, this, this. This and this. I've had many people come to me and say, hey, Chris, we really need to build a workout gym where we can all listen to Christian music and work out together. All kinds of people. And all I envision is a bunch of people doing aerobics listening to Amy Grant, you know. (laughs) I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Instead, I think what's so much better is that we stay where we're at so that we can rub shoulders with people that need our influence and our voice in their lives so that we can be be able to make a difference in the sphere of influence of where God has placed us in all over North Dallas. So, like, we could do that, but it's just not our sweet spot. I've had people come to me and they say, hey, Chris, we really need to open up a K through 12 uh, grade Christian school. We could do that. It's just not our sweet spot. I've had others that have come and said, hey, you know, you guys have got some really creative things, how you do, you know, media and graphics. And man, I think I know what we can do. We can hire Christian actors and have Christian scripts and come up with Christian movies to touch people's lives. And we could do that. It's just not our sweet spot. In fact, let me say it like this. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Everybody, don't ever allow good things to distract you from the best. I love how my wife Tatum did this when our kids were were really small. People would come, all, people would come to her all the time. They're like, they would say, hey, Tatum, would you please come on this all-nighter girls trip that's out of town for a couple nights? Or would you please come work for us? Or would, would you please come and speak at this certain event? And she would, I mean, they said all kinds of things to her. And she would always reply with this idea that I'm doing a good work right now. And I cannot come down. I'm raising up two kids And I'm speaking into the lives of hundreds of teenage girls. And I'm taking care of Chris. (laughs) And how many of y'all know that's like two full-time jobs right there? (laughs) I'm doing a good work right now. I cannot come down. And some of you need to hear that today. You need to hear this. Some of you, you... You you are raising up three children and you're working a full-time job and somebody needs to remind you today that you're doing a good work raising up those children. And even though there's all these different opportunities that are vying at you, you need to respond back possibly and say, I'm doing a good work right now and I cannot come down. Or maybe you're in business. And there's all the pressures of business all around and you're, you're leading in your area and on top of that, you're leading a life group. And people are asking you, hey, would would you join this, our softball team? Would you go on this hunting trip or this this fishing trip? You may need to respond back to them. I'm doing a good work right now. And I'm not coming down. 
Maybe you're a student. You're earning your degree, and you're involved in our, our LF students. You're pouring your life into this next generation. And you have all kinds of people that are saying, hey, man, come on up with us to this beach trip, with us on this excursion. You may need to look back at them and say, I'm doing something very important right now. I'm doing what God has told me to do. I'm doing a good work right now, and I will not come down. Everybody, that's some good preaching right there. I'm just going to tell you that right now, because that's not bad preaching, all right? That's good preaching. Amen. That's good. I'm just telling you, get ready. The minute that you begin to step out to do what God has asked you to do, the fight will intensify, and your enemy's first weapon against you, he will try to distract you. Get ready. Here's the second thing. Your enemy is going to try to discredit you. Distract and discredit. Understand when you are making a difference for God, he is going to try to do this. And he's going to try to, to do it in two ways, primarily. And here's the first one. Your enemy is going to try to discredit you by spreading rumors. So everybody, just get ready for it. The more that you do for God, the greater your kingdom impact. Just get ready for the rumors to fly, for more people to gossip about you, for people to misunderstand you, to misinterpret your motives, your decisions. And you know what? That's just a part of leadership. Here's the way I say it is this, that your spiritual enemy, Satan, has this ability to make one voice seem like a thousand. It's not even true. In fact, let's see this play out in this story. It says this in verse 5. Then the fifth time. Think about that. This guy's persistent. Sanballat sent his aide with me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter. Now let me just stop right there and explain this to you. What's an unsealed letter? This was a letter that was meant to be read out in public. What was he trying to do? The enemies were trying to undermine Nehemiah's leadership in front of everybody else. They were trying to spread rumors. It's a lot like a social media post. Because with one post, what are you trying to do? You want everybody to listen to it. You want everybody to hear it. And this is what was written. It is reported among the nations, nations, and even Geshem says this is true. And remember, Geshem's a really bad guy. Even Geshem says it's true that you, the Jews, are plotting to revolt, and therefore you, Nehemiah, that's why you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king. What are they doing? They're spreading rumors, trying to undermine Nehemiah's leadership. And none of this was even true. Now, this report will get back to the come. Let us confer together. Watch this, everybody. Here's the truth. Nehemiah was the most selfless leader that you could possibly ever find. He was the governor of the state, meaning this, as the governor, he had right to take as much food and as much wealth from everybody that he wanted to. He could have made himself rich, but instead, Nehemiah goes the extra mile, sacrifices his own finances to be able to take the people of Israel out of their poverty and to restore their city so that the nation would become strong again. He was falsely accused. I'm just telling you, the more you make a difference for God, get ready for your spiritual leader, or your spiritual enemy to attack you. And all kinds of rumors are going to be spread about you. They're going to misunderstand you. They're going to misinterpret you. It's coming. It's just a part of leadership. In fact, I'll say it like this. Opposition doesn't come because we're doing something wrong. It's happening in your thing. Right. And when those rumors come, when they try to undermine you, you need to do the exact same thing that Nehemiah did. He did three things. He addressed them and said, no, that's not true. He took it to God in prayer, and then he got back to work. That's what I try to do. I'm not perfect at it, but I'm going to let them know, hey, that's not true. 
I'm going to take it to God in prayer, and I'm going to get my butt back to work. You know, um, it's funny to me when I hear rumors about myself. You know, for the longest time, they were pretty boring. Like, I, I, all the time, people would say, you know, Chris really doesn't believe the Bible, and he can't be trusted, and he just preaches entertainment, Christianity, and blah, 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 blah. Obviously, you've never been around here before. Obviously. But uh, in the last couple years, they've gotten a whole lot more creative. <laughs> like, they're, they're actually a little bit entertaining. I had a guy ask me one time, he said, he said, uh, uh, I've heard that you collect Lamborghinis. I said, sir, the only thing I've ever collected in my life was baseball cards when I was in elementary school. (laughs) That's it. I said, man, I drive a Hyundai Elantra. That's what I drive, you know. I said, dude, that's ridiculous. I said, I I probably would have a hard time picking out a Lamborghini in a parking lot, you know. I... Here recently, uh, just, just a couple weeks ago, Tatum and I, we went to, uh, we went to Florida. Uh, we went on a little vacation. There's a generous couple in the church that has a real nice beach house right there. They said, hey, you just come and stay there with, uh, for free. And, and I didn't know how badly we needed this. I'm going to tell you, after three years of all the, the challenges that we have gone through in leadership I mean, think about it. You guys remember it. I mean, we had COVID, and then there's all the riots and the, 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 the political tension. And on top of that, we were caring for our entire community and then inviting our community back in, into, the, into church, in-person services. And then on top of that, raising millions of dollars to be able to build the building, going through construction, and then trying to begin to land or opening the building and then beginning to land the plane of construction. I'm just going to tell you, we were shot. So I actually added it up. In those course of three years, days of personal vacation, 29 days. And that's not something that's going to continue, guys. I'm just telling you, okay? That's not how I want to live my life, okay? Uh, But I just really felt this um, responsibility to our community, to you, in the midst of the most difficult season of our lives. And then I, I, I felt this commitment that we had to make sure that this was completed correctly. And so... Tatum and I, we get to the beach, we're relaxing, been there for about three days, and all of a sudden this lady messages Tatum, and, and, and this is what it says. She slams us. She says, you are the, the laziest pastors ever, and all we ever see you do is take vacations. I remember a couple years ago, uh, <laughs> I, I had a guy, I don't even know him, doesn't attend our church, never met him, he's never met me. He emails me. And the subject line of the email says, you are a sad excuse for a pastor. So I was curious. <laughs> so I clicked the button, you know, to see. He accused me of having a church helicopter <laughs> that I just went to different places, that I have a horrible marriage, my marriage is falling apart, that I, I misuse church finances all the time, and that I, my morals are all messed up. He, he questioned my, my love for God. He questioned my, the call of God on my life. And, and so what I did, like any good leader, I hit delete. But after the 10th email, I thought, you know, let me respond to this guy. So I said, I said, sir, I said, I think you have me confused with somebody else. Single thing of what you're saying here. I'm just, I just promise you, my man. He wrote back, he fired back, said, no, you're a lion, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell you, I have only been in a helicopter. God is my witness one time. And I threw up nine times. I'm never going in another helicopter again. I'm telling you that motion sickness gets me. I was sick for like two days. Listen, everybody, check this out. 
Don't let what people say take you away from doing what God has called you to do. I'm just telling you, the more that you do for God, get ready for the attacks to come, get ready for them to gossip about you, make rumors about you, misunderstand you, misinterpret your, your intentions. Don't give them the time of day. Respond to them, that's not true. You take it to God in prayer and get yourself back to work. Amen, everybody. Take it to God. Take it to God and get back to work. Take it to God and get back to work. Here's the second thing that he's going to try doing this today. You catching something out of this. Number two, your enemy is going to try to discredit you by tempting you to compromise. To compromise your integrity. To get you to sin. To discredit your name. And in verse number 10... This is when things get really twisted. Okay, this is that soap opera-ish part. So Shemaiah, who was the temple priest, comes in and says to Nehemiah, hey, Nehemiah, verse number 10, let's meet in the house of God inside the temple and let us close the temple doors because men are coming to kill you. In other words, hey, Nehemiah, you get inside the temple because there's all these people that are after you. We're not going to find you. But I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah, remember, he's the bad guy, and Sanballat, another bad guy, had hired him. So notice this. This temple priest was a double agent. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this. Because you remember that it was not permitted, buddy, but the temple priest to be able to go inside the temple. You stepped in and you would have committed a sin. And in doing so, that would have given Nehemiah a bad name. And what was their whole intent in doing that? Come on, say it out loud with me. To discredit him. I'm telling you that when you're trying to make a difference for God, when you're beginning to move forward, you're close to accomplishing what God has called you to do, your spiritual enemy is going to try to discredit you. Think about this. Think about how easily it would have been going on that plan. Because let me tell you something. Listen to this. The more effective you become in leadership the easier it is for you to begin to believe that you're entitled to things that you're not entitled to. Did you hear me? The more, the, the more effective you become in ministry, the more effective you become in your, your field of expertise, the more effective you become in leadership. The easier it is for you to begin to believe that you're entitled to more than you're actually entitled to. Think about how easy this could have played out in Nehemiah's mind. He could have said, hey, everybody, look at me. I am the man. Check me out. I mean, for 140 years, you guys haven't been able to do squat. I show up 52 days, everybody. I'm making it happen. Do you know how valuable I am? You guys couldn't do nothing until I showed up. Look how you like me now. Check me out. If anybody needs to be protected in the temple... Is this guy right here. Because you don't got me, you lose everything. I'm just telling you, the more effective you get in leadership, the easier it is for your spiritual enemy to convince you that you are more than you are. So maybe you look in the mirror and go, man, I'm the man. Look at everything that I can produce, everything that I can accomplish Man, the ladies like me a lot, and they should, because I make it happen all the time. Look at me. Look at my style. Look at what I can produce. Check, check me out. And unfortunately, you begin to believe that you're entitled to more than you're actually entitled to. And you give in to sexual temptation. And in one bad act... You discredit years and years of a good name. Not just for yourself, but for your family. Or maybe for you, you're exceptional in business. Oh, man, 
You're top of your game. I mean, everything you touch just seems to thrive and grow. I mean, you, everywhere you go, people just respect your ability and, in, in, and you're married. And it just seems like, you know, your wife isn't meeting all of your needs. And so you begin to think one day, you know what? I deserve to have all of my needs met. Because look at everything that I do. Look at how I produce. Look at how I perform. Look at everything that I've been able to accomplish. And I'm not getting my needs all the way met. And so what you do is you... You give into that sexual temptation. You step outside the bounds of marriage. And in one act, years and years and years of a good name. Or maybe you're the person that you're in the office and everybody looks to you as the spiritual guru. Like they look at you and they're like, man, that guy knows God. Maybe you even host a life group in, your, in, your mar, in, in the work. I mean, your boss comes to you and asks for prayer. Like people just come to you and just like, hey, could you please counsel me for all these different things? And one day you begin to think, you know what? They don't even realize how valuable I am at this company. Man, they don't even appreciate me. Do everything that I do for them. Man, if it wasn't for me, they'd never have been able to make all those numbers and do all these different things. And then the day comes that instead of charging that as a personal expense, you just say, ah, I'm going to charge it as a business expense. And in one act, you sacrifice your integrity. I'm going to tell you, the closer you get, to doing what God has told you to do, the harder your enemy will fight to stop you. And when your enemy tries to start to fight you, you're going to need to fire back at him. I'm not coming down. The second thing you're going to need to say to him is this, that I'm not giving up. Come on, everybody. Say those words out loud with me today. I'm not giving up. And that's exactly what Nehemiah did. Shemaiah said, hey, let's go to the temple. They're trying to kill you. And in verse 11, he says, but I said, should a man like me run away? Or should one like me go into the temple to save his life? He says, what? I will not go go. In other words, I came here to build a wall, and I'm not backing away from it until I complete that wall. I am not giving up. I am not giving up my integrity. I am not giving up the call. I'm not giving up the task that God has given to me. I will deny to be denied. I refuse to be. God has called me to do. And if, if, if God be for me, who can be against me? We're going to rise up, and we're going to accomplish what God has set forth for us to do. Amen, everybody. You're going to have to get it deep down on the inside of you. You're going to have to say, listen, I'm doing a great work. And I'm not what? Come on, somebody help me out. I'm not coming down. Your enemy is going to try to get you to quit. But what he doesn't understand is that there is no quit on the inside of you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives on the inside of you. And they tried to put him down, but three days later, baby, he got back up again. What your enemy doesn't understand is that there is no quit on the inside of you. God has called you for a reason and a season. He has given you a task, and you're going to finish the wall. You're going to finish the assignment. You're going to do what God has called you to do. Even if the enemy tries to distract you and to deter you, you're going to rise up and be what God has called you to be. Amen, everybody. Amen. Amen. And so this is how the story ends. Team. So the wall was completed in how many days? 52. 52. Now watch this. There was no lightning from heaven striking down all the enemies. There was no talking donkeys. There was no mystical magic handkerchiefs. All we see here is the miraculous power of God working through leadership and determination. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations, they were afraid. They lost their self-confidence. Why? Because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. 
What everybody had said was impossible was not impossible with God. And here's the deal. Let me just say this. Don't grow weary in doing well. Because in due season, you will reap if you don't lose heart. Don't give up. Who was Nehemiah? Ordinary guy. Just happened to get a burden that was extraordinary. He sat and he cried. He knelt and he prayed. He stood up and acted. He got a clear, clear vision from God. He spent the work and planned it out carefully. And then he took action. He traveled a thousand miles, giving up the luxuries of the palace. When everybody tried to deter him, when everyone tried to discredit him, spread rumors about him, get him off that wall, say it's too tough and it's never going to happen, he's a horse. And God did a miracle. Because what people couldn't do in 140 years, through his faithfulness, it was accomplished in 52 days. And here's what I believe, that God's going to do the same thing in and through you. Amen, everybody? Amen. Come on, why don't you bow your heads? What's God speaking to you about today? What's he talking to you about? You know, the one thing that I am very much right now is that there are numbers of you that it's time for you to stand and act. It's time. It's time. Some of you have been allowing the little things to distract you. And what you've discovered is that the enemy hasn't even needed to fight you. He's, you're, you're running all over the place. You, you, you've Almost in a sense, you've walked away from the vision and the purpose and the plan that God has for you because of all these little things. And it's time. God's giving some of you clarity right now. I just feel that in the spirit. There's a clarity that's happening to, to many of you right now. Lord, I just pray that you would do a deep work on the inside of us. We want to be people that please you. We want to be people that honor you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So do that in us, I pray. And if from Christ, you don't have to remain in that place. You just need to know that he loves you with an undying love. You see, there's nothing that you've ever done that has disappointed God. There's nothing that you've ever done that has frustrated God. Because he knew you would do all those things, and yet he still came to the cross, and he paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future. And all you need to do in order for your life to change it's for you to finally admit that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior. His name is Jesus. And so right where you're at, would you, would you pray this prayer? Those of you in correctional facilities, those of you online, here in the service, just pray. Jesus, I surrender all of me to you. I confess that I've gone my own way. And I need a Savior. So I'm going to ask you to change my life. Cleanse me of all of my sin. And I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God. And so thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer today. Thank you for changing me and saving me. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. And all God's people, come on, say A. Amen. Can we just welcome so many of these folks into the family of God? We are so honored and we are so proud of the change that is happening in lives all across this place. And, you know, it's just amazing to me every weekend that we have the opportunity to speak into the lives of 35,000 people. 35,000. And the reports that come in and the lives that are being changed. I'm just so proud of you, and I just want to change for you. And if you did pray that prayer and you're able to, please text Fresh Start to that phone number there, and we're going to send you some information. 
So if you guys would, all across this place, would you guys stand to your feet? Let me just remind you that 21 days of prayer continues this week. I'll be tomorrow morning with Tatum leading uh, the 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. time. And then we also have a Tuesday night prayer gathering, full worship, and then every day at noon on Instagram Live. And we hope that you guys would join with us. So, ways to give are on the screen. Let me bless you today as you give. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his great face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Love you, everybody. If you need prayer, we're here today to pray with you here around the front. God bless you, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow morning, 6 a.m.